Well, welcome, John. Um, would you please state your name for this recording? Well, um, in my architectural life, I, I uh, use the name John D. Kelly. D for my middle name, Dennis. And so J-D-K-A-I-A. -A. Oh, that's why that is. I never knew that. I never knew what the D stood for, so thank you for that. Another, another Dennis. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly what I was going to say. So. Um, so, John, let's just start off a little bit uh, uh, to learn about you as a person. Um, just some general background, where you were born, um, where you grew up, a little bit about your family background and your childhood. Would you be willing to share a little bit about that? I'm glad to do that. Um, I was born in Los Angeles in 1945, and um, I, uh, we moved to the San Fernando Valley in 50, and I lived there all throughout my um, elementary, middle school, and high school years. So I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Sherman Oaks. Uh, my dad was an electrical engineer for the Department of Water and Power. And my dad, my mom um, was a traditional housewife, but they, they were both college graduates. <clears throat> and my dad from USC and my mom from UCLA, which rivalry, rivalry or rivals in the <laughs> LA area. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, the, uh, we lived in a um, neighborhood that changed very rapidly as I was growing up. When we moved out there in 1950, it was uh, somewhat rural. The street wasn't paved. All the, well, there were ranch houses, but they'd been built one at a time. They were all uh, custom. They were modest, but they were not built all at one time, like the tract homes that came in not too long after that. But uh, um, in the, you know, from 1950 to 63, <clears throat> when I graduated from high school, um, the development you see in the San Fernando Valley happened just in that 13 years. All the tract houses, the 101 freeway, the shopping centers, the apartments. Um, so that made a big impression on me that um, there, although I loved growing up, it was a wonderful neighborhood, lots of kids to play with. Um, schools were good, although I was kind of, a, I was, a, let's say, a, an, um, an erratic student. So if I got interested and excited, I did well. If I didn't, I was just sort of middle of the road. Um, but boy, it made me an impression on me about if growth could make a lot of negative impacts. There was a lot of smog, there was a lot of noise, and so on. So that was, uh, I think, one of the reasons that I became environmentally concerned and aware, and that played into my later career as an architect. So John, did you have brothers and sisters, or were you an only I'm child? An only, no siblings. Um, I did have, on both sides, a lot of cousins. So um, we had extended family that got together on holidays. And that um, was uh, something that gave me an experience I wouldn't have had otherwise being an only child. Um, so growing up, was there any one person that might have influenced you? Or you, you talked about your influences um, to become an environmentalist, but is, was there any um, person in your life that, that influenced your, your development, uh, whether that's related to architecture or the environment or just life in general? Well, um, through high school graduation, I was close with my parents and they were my biggest influence by far. My dad in some ways, my mom and others. And it was not until college that, um, and at, especially even more after college, when um, uh, people outside my family became influential. Professors or uh, well, friends? Um, or... Yeah, um, at UCSB, um, 
I started in 63. Um, I took five years to graduate. I graduated in 68. And my degree is in economics. And there's a long involved story about the different ways that that took place. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But I would say in the college, my fifth year, fourth and fifth years, I uh, became acquainted with um, David Gebhardt, who goes Santa Barbans know from his influence on local architecture, but he was the head of the architectural history department. And I took classes from him and then did independent studies with him. So that was uh, influential. And um, the backstory to UCSB days was that I, I knew about Santa Barbara because growing up in high, in high school, I was very interested in the sports car races. And Santa Barbara used to have races at the airport back in the day, back in the early 60s. And if you saw the movie um, Ford versus Ferrari, there, one of the major characters, Ken Miles, was somebody who grew up, who was one of the Southern California racers that would be at the Santa Barbara airport. So when the, the time came to choose college, I couldn't, could I choose between USC and UCLA? My parents, alma maters will know, UCSB looked pretty good to me because Santa Barbara is beautiful and it was a UC and, but not too far away. And um, so the picture changed. <laughs> um, and so uh, my, uh, my plan was to uh, attend, uh, UCSB for one year and then transfer to an architectural school. But um, once I got to UCSB, I made friends, I joined a fraternity, I got interested in other things. I was a bio major for a while. And then my dad had always wanted me to go into business with him because they had a side business in um, mortgages, in, in uh, real estate loans. And so one thing led to another and I majored in economics and that's why I got my degree in economics. But I still was intrigued by um, architecture. I still was drawn to architecture. So in the fall of 68, after I had graduated from UCSB, I went to architectural school at USC. And um, I enjoyed that, but I had been in school for a long, long time. And there was a long number of years ahead of me to get a professional degree. And um, along with various other things, I decided to move back to Santa Barbara and um, see what career I could pursue at, with the education that I have. And it turned out that I couldn't get an architectural position when I got back to Santa Barbara. And I had a first career from 1969 to 1972 at Raytheon in Belita. It was a, what they called a program control analyst, which was related to my business economics and uh, bookkeeping background. And um, so now it's 19, uh, during that time, however, when I moved back to Santa Barbara, that's when I would say, the first influencer in my professional life came in. Um, I rented a place on Larrera Road in, in uh, East, Eastern Montecito uh, from a contractor designer named Bill Painter. And he'd built some duplexes there in the Spanish style. And we became friends and um, eventually uh, he helped me to design and build a little uh, cottage on a property on Danielson Road. That was my first design build project. And I learned about designing, permitting, construction, and so on. Um, so I did early design work from 1970 to 75. I did the Danielson project and lived in it. I uh, did drafting another, um, Influencer came into my life at that time was Michael Carmichael. He was a structural engineer and, and designer. And a bunch of us worked for him 
during that time. And what I did for Michael was I did drafting on his um, projects. Uh, a lot of people did construction work on his projects. Um, and they were mostly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, so uh, the next big change came about around 1975. I got a, a lot up on Coyote Road and I designed my first house. You know, not the bungalow, but a, a 2,200 square foot contemporary craftsman house. Um, and that launched my design and construction business, which went from 75 to 84. Um, I was a designer, builder, and contractor, did uh, lots of homes and various remodels. Also in that period, um, I got involved with the Community Environmental Council, and they were doing the beginning to plan the Mesa project. And I met more uh, influencing colleagues through that. That's when I met uh, Dennis Thompson and Jim Tremaine. And Dennis remains a close friend. I'm not sure how Jim is doing. He lives in Ojai, but they were very uh, influential. And um, I think the notable project from that period was the Moore Residence, um, which was a active and passive solar design that was on the 1982 Santa Barbara Solar Tour. So that was, there was an early group of us uh, Dennis, Jim, I think that was when I met Howard Wittosh. There were, although I was not an architect yet, I, I was um, being involved with their um, their activities and being in kind of a, uh, a colleague and contemporary, although I was not licensed at that point. Sorry, I had a little interruption there. Well, John, that's so interesting. I didn't know that you had a background in economics. Um, you know, what inspired you to come to UCSB? And I've known you for a number of years and I've never heard yeah. this story, so I love it. Um, one question though, you when you first came to UCSB, you were already interested in architecture yeah. at that time. So you were gonna major in it and then you went into economics. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What what inspired you to to want to get into architecture at that point in your life? Yeah, I, going back to high school, I had as a, a child. I, I've I've always been loved to draw and build things, and um, so I took art classes and drafting classes, and eventually there was uh, an architectural drafting class in high school. Oh. And so that I think was, that certainly was a, something that in, made me intrigued with architecture. And of course, um, I think the image that we had, many of us had of architects was Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, you know, he was the, the most famous architect and glamorous and controversial and all those sorts of things. So I was intrigued by all that. Um, but clearly I was pulled in a lot of different <laughs> directions uh, in high school and college. But also, when you were telling your story, I found it interesting how you got into design build, which um, which probably, I would imagine, really influenced you as an architect because to understand how something is actually constructed, I think, makes you a better architect. So. Um, is there anything else you want to say about that aspect of your career? I, I believe it has served me well, and I uh, highly recommend that people get some sort of construction experience because there's the, you know, initial design and there's the end product, but there's a, a really complicated and interesting process between the concept and, and the reality. So, uh, yeah, um, it really was the way my way in the door was to start doing design build and it was both uh, Michael Carmichael and Bill Painter had that those were models that I followed in doing that. Now uh, it's interesting that you asked that because um, 
it kind of segues into the next step, which was um, in the late, in the, in the middle 80s, 82 to 84, um, real estate um, had a problem because the, and there were many economic problems because the interest rates were very, very high. This was, they went up to 18 or 20% at one point. And um, so I had, uh, in, in addition to doing projects for clients, I had, I did three spec houses, one at a time. Uh, first one on Il, um, Mount Calvary, the second one on El Cielito, and the third one on Stanwood. And I had the we I was getting ready to sell the house. We'd completed the house on Stanwood, the third one, around that around 1982, and the market was dead. And my spec house part of my business depended on selling that and buying another property to develop. And so that kind of put an end to that. And then um, I had a business partner and we weren't, there was problems with the partnership. And um, it also, because projects over the, that time, the cost of construction just went up and up and up and up and people more and more, rather than doing design build wanted a design and then get bids and um, have competition on the price. And so it was much more difficult to get um, projects for clients. So all of that with various pressures made me realize, well, I either need to con concentrate on construction or I need to pursue becoming an architect. And um, I found out that although I didn't have a professional degree in California, um, my, my economics degree, degree counted as two years and my contracting experiences counted at two years for the four years of education. And so I had to do four years of apprenticeship and pass the exam. So I sort of took a leap into the unknown and um, in 1984, I started my apprentice work for architects in town. And I worked during the 84 to 89, I worked for four architects, Bob Easton, Brian Kernall, Gil Garcia, and Jim Tremaine. So it was a really interesting, broad experience of uh, different characters and different types of work. So, um, and it did work out that I, <laughs> I was able to complete my requirements and take the exam. So um, also that's when I got involved in AIA. In 1984, um, I joined the AIA when I became an apprentice, I, I joined. And I was a built environmental education instructor from 86 to 88. This is a program that Jim Tremaine started and uh, I was working on a project at Elwood School and that's, you, you go into a elementary school class and work with the kids on a project, whether it's about building a, a city or um, studying a mission, uh, the history of mission design. It's a, a once a week session with, with, within the class. And so that was, that was fun and exciting. Um, talking about AIA then that led me to become more involved and I was president in 92 of the local AIA chapter. So um, the apprenticeship, I guess the project I'd like to feature in that period was the El Elwood Elementary School project that I did as a project architect for Jim Tremaine. And so we did a new um, uh, administrative and <clears throat> um, central complex for the school, which um, so that included the administrative offices, a new auditorium, a library, and some other, some classrooms and a big courtyard. <clears throat> that was, uh, the exterior of it was inspired by the little gas station, the old gas station right down Hollister from the school with the blue and white checkerboard tile in the tower. The auditorium had a tower entrance. 
Um, and that project got a Goleta Beautiful Award. And um, so that's one of the projects that I uh, feel good about having worked on. Oh, John, that's impressive that you went from working and learning in the field um, to getting your license in a very unique way that most architects don't follow that path. Um, and then your experience with a range of different architects to understand different approaches and, and, and styles um, is fascinating. And then getting involved, I know you've always been a community a person, you've always been involved with the local community in so many ways, and we can talk about that in a minute, but for you to go and get involved with AIASB and within a short period of time, become the president is really an interesting pathway. So um, I just want to honor you for that, um, with your involvement and your giving back to the community. So. Well, thank you, Karen. It was uh, really, um, I'm not sure what it took me so long <laughs> to find the right place, Ar meaning architecture. But uh -huh. once I found it, I feel like it's really, uh, things came into focus for me professionally. Yeah. And then when you started your own company, yeah. it's from my knowledge of you, it seemed like seems like you focused on residential construction for the most part. Would you say that's true? So uh, I launched my uh, firm in 1989. Okay. Um, pretty much right after I passed the exam. So I'd done my apprenticeship. I took, I was going to take the exam one year and there were technical reasons why I wasn't able to take it that year. And it's a good thing because I wasn't really prepared. But the preparation I'd done then plus the preparation to the next year, I was able to pass the whole thing on the first try. And so that, <laughs> I was really happy about that. So um, I loved working for Jim Tremaine, but I just seem to be a person that likes to do their own thing. So on 89, I launched my own um, business and um, I was, uh, I did do mostly residential projects. I also did uh, some uh, institutional projects for schools and also um, some um, commercial projects, um, and I can talk about all that. I, 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 the first project um, that's notable, I think, after I started JDK AIA um, is called Altito, or Little Tower, and it's up near Painted Cave, and the background on that is that um, I had met uh, Joe and Pam Cocker when I worked for Bob Easton. And Bob had done a project on that property near Painted Cave that I was the project architect for. And you're referring to Joe Cocker, the musician, I yeah. have a feeling. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. The, the famous Mad Dogs and Englishman, Joe Cocker. And mostly I worked, Pam was the mover and shaker, Joe was doing his music thing. And um, so that was really a unique opportunity. It's um, probably the most unique design that I've done. It's a three-story tower with stone and wood. It was inspired by things like Anasazi ruins. And there's a, a poet named Robinson Jeffers, famous in Big Sur, and he, had, he built a tower of stone called Tor. And, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright built the Romeo and Juliet Tower in, in Wisconsin. So those sort of little iconic tower buildings were an influence for that. And it won the, the uh, an AIA SB Design Award. So I'm very proud of that one. And it really was um, a unique opportunity. Um, I'd love to see photos of that when you send them over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll be sharing those. And um, also in, let's see, um, 
a, another early project, 94, the Kurland residence in Montecito, completely different um, agenda from the owners. They loved um, Venetian Gothic architecture. They're very sophisticated, um, very familiar with Venice. And um, <clears throat> so that is a Venetian, two-story Venetian Gothic villa. And it's on a little um, lane, uh, Arica Lane, that's up near uh, East, just below East Valley Road, to hidden away in the hedgerows. Um, but that one is Santa Barbara Beautiful Award. So that was another project. Um, and then Joan Pam came calling again. They bought a ranch in uh, Western Colorado near Gunnison Canyon and um, Needle Rock Valley. It's just, it's very rural area on the Western slope of the Rockies. And um, they um, wanted an English country manor. And so that's what we designed, two story, really large. Um, and we're talking a manor house, like 15,000 square feet you know, master house up and eight guest suites upstairs, just a um, uh, beautiful setting with views in all directions. And um, that one got published in Colorado Homes and Lifestyles. So um, Joe and Pam were great uh, clients for me. So now though um, the, main institutional project I want to talk about was expanding Cold Spring Elementary School. Cold Spring uh, is, is where my children went to elementary school. A lot of friends there. I had done um, some volunteer work for the school and um, then uh, they decided to do a major expansion. Um, new library, new classrooms, patios, new maintenance facilities, upgrades to the auditorium, play fields and parking. And I was fortunate enough to be chosen as architect for that project. Um, I did partner with uh, Thompson Naylor Architects on that. And um, the inspiration for the, all of the buildings on that campus are the 1927 Spanish style original main building by Joseph Plunkett. And, um, so that was a very interesting and time consuming and challenging project. And we got it done around 2000. And it was on an early um, Freight of Green Buildings tour and uh, it got a Santa Barbara Beautiful Award. And um, it's, uh, as far as I know, still serving the community well. Yeah, well, congratulations uh, on that one, yeah. yeah. So um, another big, ch so big change came about around, around that time is that um, my wife and I decided to downsize. Our children were grown on their own. It was around 2001 and we'd lived on Coyote Road since uh, 75 and we loved it there, but it, you know, we wanted to be closer to town, more convenient, smaller, and also um, reduce our ecological footprint. And so we bought a home on the Mesa in the Marine Terrace in 2001. And um, we remodeled it um, in 2002 and, and then we completed the remodel in 2005. And that's what I call our Zen bungalow. That's where I'm sitting today in my home office. And um, it's uh, really was, you know, it, it's um, in many ways, it's a normal uh, whole house remodel, but it's an example of an eco remodel taking a 1951 tract house and um, making it efficient, making it more comfortable, more livable, and sort of renewing renewing and, and uh, uh, the life of that 
building and uh, making it last much longer. And um, so, yeah, that's uh, brought us to the Mesa. And then a couple of recent, more recent projects happened after the T fire, which uh, the T fire was devastating in our old uh, Coyote Road neighborhood. And it actually destroyed our home that somebody else owned at that point. Um, and uh, one of our neighbors, the Harlans lost their home. And um, so I designed a new home for them. Um, and their concept was a New Zealand farmhouse, kind of a, a, a hip roofed um, main building. And um, then it had a, a garage and workshop creating a courtyard. And the notable thing about that was that it was done with roster block fire resistant construction. So that was a response to the fire danger that of course we're still dealing with. And many of us were involved in all the events following the T fire, the rebuilding and trying to up our game in terms of houses that could be more protected from wildfires. And um, another friend um, was over on Gibraltar Road. And although fire, the main part of the fire didn't come through there, he was on the boundary of it, but embers came in and burned down his house that he loved dearly. It was an old Frank Robinson design um, built in hills, hillside with panoramic views. And uh, of course it was all wood, construction that had used bridge timbers from Big Sur and was highly flammable and <laughs> um, the old design didn't come close to meet any any of the current um, building codes and structural standards. So that's um, the notable thing about that was applying um, new standards to the design of the interior. So I reorganized parts of the interior, kept the parts that, that uh, worked, but kept the original design concept of the two pavilions with a connecting element that came from um, uh, Frank Robinson. And um, we made it fire resistant, we made it solar, we made it very efficient. And um, uh, that, uh, got a certificate from the green building program. So those are kind of the, to me, I went back and looked at the menu of projects and those were some of the notable ones that bring us up today. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great, John. I, I remember going to the Harlan home on the Parade of Green Buildings. I remember that. And uh, just a little aside while you were talking earlier, I was thinking back to when I met you. And I was trying to think, because I was involved with the BEEP program for a little bit. I actually worked with Michel Saint-Sulpice out at Isla Vista School, I remember that. But I think I met you in 1990, or just before 1990, when we were working on Earth Day. And um, when I worked at the Community Environmental Council, and we wanted to build a replica of a little green home. Mm -hmm. um, you might remember that project. And, and yeah. someone said, oh, talk, talk to John Kelly. And, and part of it was because we wanted to use hardy fiber cement board and we had all this structure. It was going to be the front of a house, a little house. And, and I think with your structural uh, engineering background, and we said, oh, you need to talk to John Kelly. So I remember meeting you then, and you came and you helped us put that together, and we had to carry it on a truck uh, from Community Environmental Council where it was built at the time well, on Miramonte Drive over to City College where Earth Day was. But do you remember that project? Do you remember being I there? do, I do. Um, yeah. You know, um, working with you, and I think Daddy got involved, and yes. um, it was it Sharon on a, Maine? Yeah. Sharon Maine, yeah. But yeah, it was, was uh, just the CEC came into my life over and over again over all those years. Mm -hmm. It started mm -hmm. when the uh, Mesa property was an abandoned uh, dairy farm. Right. There were a few old buildings, and that's when uh, 
uh, Paul Rellis and Dennis and Jim and I wandered, went up there and looked around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and talked about how to, how to develop the property to Paul's vision. Yeah. And the other way that I know you is definitely um, through the sustainability project. And um, you were very involved with that. And I don't if if that's something that you would care to talk about um, your yeah. involvement with that. Yeah, that's um, a 20 year involvement. Um, and so I mentioned being AIA president and the um, President, AIA president who followed me was Eddie Pikert, and he had a vision to do a conference on sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so in 1993, we, that, um, a group of AIA architects, including Dennis and Jim and Betty and I, started talking about doing a conference, and that was really where the sustainability project emerged from the planning and implementation of that conference in 93. And we decided, well, this, this is something we really need to continue. And it, uh, in the beginning, it was uh, under the umbrella of the Architectural Foundation. So it very much was a product of the AIA and the Architectural Foundation. And then at some point, I, uh, um, we decided we'd be best to become an independent nonprofit, and we did that. But um, yeah, I was involved from 93 to 2014 when we um, completed it. And um, it still lives on in the form of a scholarship. I just got a notice from the Scholarship Foundation. The annual scholarship was awarded to a local student. Um, uh, that student is uh, um, plans to major in environmental science at UC Santa Cruz and to become a landscape architect specializing in native plants. So that's still going on. Uh, is, is there anything that you would like to say? Uh, you, you mentioned the evolution of your career and how, how you did passive solar homes early on and you uh, did green and sustainable homes and fire resistant homes, but is there anything that you would like to say about that focus in your life and in your career um, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, green building standpoint? Well, um, I think it was related to the, the thing that I talked about with the impacts of growth in the San Fernando Valley and around the same time, 19, I mean, 1962, right when I was in high school, um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published and all the uh, publicity around the, the, the poisoning of the environment and um, the problem with getting corporations to pay attention to their impacts. Um, so that environmental consciousness, I think, then led to, um, you know, the, uh, I said the solar tour was in 82. It was in the late 70s, early 80s. The solar movement emerged with Ed Masria and others that talked about the solar um, design. And so that really, the arch, that's the architectural aspect of, of taking care of the environment is mm -hmm. to make the buildings be uh, resilient and self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I know you're an avid reader. You're always staying on top of environmental issues. Just from my experience with you, uh, you're always very thoughtful in how you approach things and you draw on your knowledge base that you've gained from reading articles and books related to this topic as well. Would you agree well, thank with you that? For that. I, that's a high compliment, Karen. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I do, I, I think one of the things that I believe about myself is I'm, I'm curious and eclectic. So I like to read a variety of things and find out and learn and try and understand what's going on. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
a lot of it related to uh, building an environment, but also related to economics and how those sorts of things work. Um, oh, that's right, your and, economic background. Yeah, um, because economics so strongly influences our behavior and in the ways that we need to reform our behavior to better take care of our, our planet, um, economics can play into that. So that kind of, uh, that's one of the things that I'm currently involved in is related to that. That's the citizens climate lobby. Mm -hmm. And the citizens climate lobby was founded in 2007 um, by a um, uh, activist uh, in uh, San Diego uh, who had been involved in good works in terms of uh, helping third world countries and so on, but he realized that the um, climate problems were going to overwhelm anything they could do to help people that were emerging in third world countries. So um, he founded this organization for average citizens to lobby their Congress people and senators to try to get beneficial policies. And shortly after the founding, it, uh, was fo it focused on something called carbon fee and dividend. And uh, it's and so that that's the advocacy that I've been involved in since uh, uh, 2014, and I'm currently the group leader for the local chapter. And there's chapters of the CCL in every pretty much every congressional district in the country, and we meet with um, it's nonpartisan. We meet with all the legislators in in DC. And carbon fee and dividend would basically put a uh, price that starts low and increases every year on greenhouse gas emissions. And so economists tell us that's the most powerful way to make the, a quicker transition from the dirty fossil fuels to the clean energy future that we need. So the carbon price and um, that's been modeled and verified. And then the dividend is, is also key because that's a, a per capita flat dividend to all Americans. So what that does is it addresses the costs that will be involved in the transition to clean energy. It protects families from the impact on their budget. And so the dividend follows the price and it goes up over time. And it goes directly like a like a social security check to all families, so they can pay their bills and uh, gradually invest in in changing their their home or or transportation, whatever they need to do. And so those are the two main carbon fee and dividend. So we're working with our representative Salud Carbajal, and he's one of the co-sponsors of a bill that follows that design. And um, so we're hopeful that in 2021, there'll be an opportunity to get some better policies uh, out of Washington, DC. So um, that's not directly related to architecture, but we are working with the national AIA to see if we can get them to support and endorse this. The national AI, AIA has been very proactive about the environment and about greenhouse emissions and climate. Ed Masri and others have led that. And there's a lot that's been done, a lot more needs to be done. And that's done in, in codes and practices in the building world. But if you have a carbon price, that makes all of that much easier to make those changes. So, it seems like that yeah. ties into architecture uh, 2030, which is the program that Ed Masria put together, but really trying to reduce our dependence on carbon. Um, so that just ties in, seems very well. It's another aspect of that whole effort. So yeah. the 2030 yeah. coalition is another thing you and I worked on together yes. um, with uh, Dennis and others. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, Ed Masria. 
and got or the local t- codes to be improved. Yeah. And uh, that's an ongoing job that we all have yeah. <laughs> in, in uh, improve our practices. Yeah. yeah. And another community part that I'd like to talk about is the Mesa Architect. I was going to ask you about that. Yes, yeah. please do. Dennis, and, Dennis Thompson and I started that up in 2009. And uh, Dennis had the vision for getting architects that lived in the Mesa neighborhood to uh, form a volunteer group to um, improve the public uh, amenities of our neighborhood. Now, you know, um, that might include um, the commercial or the or the the parks or the streets. So one of the first challenges we took on was Cliff Drive because it was a state highway when we got started and uh, it was it's a high it was high speed and um, no crosswalks no signals to speak of really divided the neighborhood <clears throat> in a negative way and <clears throat> we were among the groups that that helped to change that the city now owns uh, cliff drive um, they took over what used to be the state highway and they've been able to make changes uh, restriping and so on, and they have more changes planned. Um, uh, and they're seeking funding for that. And they're on uh, the uh, Las Positas part of that old highway. Now they're doing a bike path. It's going to start construction this year that go, that's going to help um, pedestrians and bikes go uh, be able to use that corridor as well as cars. So one of the things I do for that group is there's a there's a local neighborhood paper called the Mesa Paper, It's published monthly, and I do a column in that for the Mesa Architects group. And um, the latest column that's going to come out this month is about the bike corridor. The one the month before was about tables in the street. It was about the thing that restaurants are doing downtown. There's also a little bit of it going on on our commercial strip where the old storefronts are near uh, Cliff and Meg's in front of the Rose Cafe. They have some tables, or they have a parklet where, where there used to be parking, there's now tables for patrons. We can nice, use. nice. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, where you're going now and how long you're going to be practicing as an architect. Um, I also would like to talk with you a little bit about get back into your personal life. And I know that Ellen has been a very big part of your life and supporting your career. And uh, I know that you have a grandchild. So those are some topics that I was hoping that you might cover as well. So you can take any or all of those topics out how, how you want. <laughs> well, just uh, in, in the order that I recall them, um, currently, um, no active projects currently. I'm not sure how much longer I'll be officially open for business, but um, I still feel interested in, and capable of, but I've been doing small projects, not any large projects, all residential. So that uh, is a little bit up in the air as to how to bring that to a close and when. Um, I'm certainly very, keep very busy with the Mesa Architects and Citizens Climate Lobby. So I don't, I'm not bored (laughs) or looking for things to do. Um, The, uh, let's see, um, family wise, uh, our uh, grandson, Harlan just uh, turned nine. Um, this month and so we had a virtual celebration because he's in San Diego and um, he's into um, a show called Gravity Falls an animated show and I don't we didn't know much about it but we were assigned characters from the show Um, Ellen was Abulita the grandmother that has an apron with pink heart on it and likes to 
follow people around and vacuum up after them. And <laughs> I, I was uh, Seuss, which is the, grand, the grown grandson uh, that uh, is, Seuss is short for Jesus. And he works at something called the Mystery Shack and he has a t-shirt with a big question mark on it. So I found one of those and we did, um, we were dressed up and when we said hello for the birthday and um, I had, I made a sign saying happy birthday Harlan that I put up in the yard that he could see. And so we had a virtual celebration. And then we also had a photographer friend come over and shoot some photos of us in our costumes. And we made a little slideshow of ourselves. So that's, um, we're managing to um, shelter in place and, um, but to keep in touch uh, through uh, Zoom meetings. And um, so this is an opportunity, kind of the silver lining that that we're doing things like this that we might not have had time to do or thought of if, if we weren't having to uh, think very much about how our activities work. Yeah. Uh, and how about Ellen? When did you meet Ellen? When tell it a little bit about oh, sure. that story, please. Yeah, well, um, the back story, um, let's start with uh, when I met Bill Painter way back in, 1969, one of the things that our friendship revolved around was sailing. Mm -hmm. Bill got interested in sailing. He got a, a uh, Olympic class boat called a Dragon, which is a wood Olympic class old fashioned sloop mm -hmm. and uh, restored it and, and recruited me to crew for him in the triangle racing here in Santa Barbara. And we actually did travel here and there um, uh, in Southern California to race. So I got into sailing and into triangle racing in particular as a crew person. And that continued when I was working at Raytheon and one of my co-workers there, Guy Turner had a sailboat and was a yacht club member. And so I crewed for him. And so in the fall of 71, um, we came in from a sailboat race and uh, Ellen was there at the yacht club and she, she was teaching elementary school at the time. And a friend of hers, another teacher had asked her to come to the yacht club to meet somebody, another uh, sailor. And so she was introduced to that guy. Uh, but I, I spotted her right away and I asked her friend, you know, to introduce me. And so I um, got a turn to talk to her and we really hit it off and liked each other right away and found out that we had a lot of, or some friends in common, um, a, uh, um, a fraternity brother of mine named Jim Ryerson. I don't, you may have known Oh, him. yes, I remember Jim. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Air pollution was control district to, uh, was married to a woman named Paulette. Well, Paulette had been a roommate with Ellen on the Mesa mm -hmm. in a little apartment on the Mesa. And so um, Jim knew me and Paulette knew Ellen and um, they had planned to introduce us. But we met at the Yacht Club uh -huh. and we found, figured that out. So we went over and we knocked on their door and said, hey, Jim and Paula, you don't need to introduce us. We've already met. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. And that's how we, we first met. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you were married when? You've been uh, together we married since 72. In yeah. 74. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And our daughter was born in 97 and our son in um, that's, is that, I mean, seven, 70, 87, 77 and 81. Our son oh. Sean in 81, our daughter in, Anne in 77. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. 
So John, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you had hoped to share? Well, let's see. Um, uh, we talked about sustainability project, a couple of spin-offs from that uh, with the Santa Barbara County Innovative Building Review Program. I know oh. you were involved in that and Dennis Allen and I um, were involved in developing the checklist and I served on that from 95 to 2002. So this is all kind of the green building mm -hmm. uh, sustainability. Yeah, stuff. well, can you talk about that program a little bit? I mean, it's, you know, that is through the county and what its goals are and, and such. Yeah, well, this was um, in the 90s as we were, we did the 94 conference on sustainability. Mm -hmm. I chaired a conference called Green Building Now in 1996. That was a big project for me and a lot of helped with that second big conference, TSP conference at City College. So we were all just learning more about green building and finding out what the resources were. And so um, the Innovative Building Review Program was, was also a, a way to be able to give advice to people who were doing projects to give them information they might not other, otherwise uh, find out about, to give them critiques and ideas, and to give them a checklist to um, compare their design uh, and uh, potentially offer improvements. And so I, I believe it might, eat, might, those consultations may still be going on. I, I haven't been involved for a long time, but mm -hmm. There were much much fewer resources available, and they were much widely uh, known. And the codes were not the codes now are very strict and and replace a lot of the things we were trying to get people to do voluntarily at that time. There's still there's a evolution of the innovative building review program, and I'm actually forgetting what its current acronym is. But but very few people come through. But it seems like the people that come through now are really wanting to get some input on on new innovations um, uh, and and how to make their homes closer to net zero and um, so there is they still come through for a while there there were a few people that came through to be able to fast track through the mm -hmm. building department when things were kind of slowed down there and it was a way to get to the front of the line so mm -hmm. there were a few people that maybe didn't weren't as altruistic as as we would hope but um but it still does exist um but those great. were some no, good that. some good some good days some good advice for the public so another public outreach was through city college mm -hmm. the city college adult education program you helped me with some many of these classes that i I was an instructor from 97 to 2009. We did a lot of classes, some on green building and then later on on sustainable living, a more mm -hmm. comprehensive look at sustainability. Right. So um, that um, the uh, economic problems in 2008 hurt the adult education program. So that was one reason that that didn't continue. Another reason was that people became much less focused on aspirational goals and more went into survival mode. So, but that was a long uh, in interaction, engagement with the public mm -hmm. because there were adult edge classes and um, there were professionals involved, but also people that were experts in uh, all sorts of things in terms of personal living practice. Mm -hmm. And through that program, as well as the sustainability project, you helped to bring a number of uh, people to town, whether it was Ed Mazaria or mm -hmm. Annie Leonard or some of the other folks. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and to, again, continue uh, educating people about some of these different issues related to sustainability and the environment, the built environment. And so thank you for your involvement well, with that. Well, and thank you because you were involved very much too. And it's, <laughs> I 
feel great about the work we did. It's, um, and I think that it helped. Um, there's not a way to measure it directly, but I just, I feel in my bones that it really did yeah. change uh, people's minds and open them to new possibilities. I think that's true. And I know that our time is just about up, but I do have a question for you. And um, what in your architectural career and, and in your in your life, I guess, uh, what would you, what what is your legacy? What would you like to be remembered for? What's so? Um, what an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, a big one. Uh, so, um, yeah, because. Uh, you know, I'm very much uh, a family person. Um, so the well-being of my children, my grandchild, my wife. Um, so, but that's very much tied to the well-being of the community. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I would say that um, I have thoroughly enjoyed designing and building and working with clients. I feel very fortunate that um, I've had lots of wonderful clients and um, rarely had any really, any conflicts with clients that you hear about. Mm -hmm. So I feel yeah. very fortunate that way. And um, so I, I am, um, so those um, projects serve families and, and um, but of course, the the school projects and the things that serve the public or or um, serve a broader audience. But I think the community service that I've done is probably, to me, in terms of legacy, is what I hope has made the biggest uh, um, benefit, biggest contribution to the well-being of our community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, John, and. Thank you for your involvement with AIASB um, in a number of different ways, you know, whether it was as the president or being involved with some of the subset projects, um, built environment, and then also the sustainability project, the evolution of, of that project. So um, I think you, you've contributed quite a bit to the architecture community in Santa Barbara in many ways. Thank you for that. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for being willing to do the interview. Sure, sure. I enjoyed it. I haven't <laughs> talked to you in a long time. And uh, I, it's I nice do too. to see. Yeah. So.